Okay, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here and to see uh, you all. So um, I'm going to talk today about, you know, free loop spaces and topological cohoc shield homology. Um, in particular, what I want to do today is I want to tell you a story about a new approach. So I want to describe a new approach um, to the study of the homology of free loop spaces. So of free loop spaces. <clears throat> so I'm interested in, you know, the homology of free loop spaces with coefficients in some field. And just remember that the free loop space is just maps from the circle into some space X. And this new approach is going to be via a relatively new invariant, which I'll introduce called topological cohoc shield homology. So everything I'm going to say today is joint with Anna Marie Bowman, <clears throat> excuse me, is joint with Anna Marie Bowman and Brooke Shipley. And there are some parts where it's also going to be joint with Amelia Hogenhagen and Stephanie Ziegenhagen, and I'll mention that at the appropriate moments. Okay, so to get started, I just want to give a little bit of motivation for why am I interested in um, thinking about the homology of free loop spaces in the first place. So this is a very classical question. People have been studying the homology of free loop spaces for many decades, in part because um, these homology groups have sort of broad applications across topology and geometry. And so I want to mention one um, theorem to illustrate the sort of thing that I mean. And this is a classical theorem from the 60s of Gromel and Meyer. And I'm not going to dive into this theorem too much, but what I want to say about it is that this theorem tells you that understanding the homology of free loop spaces on a manifold actually tells you about closed geodesics on the manifold. So that's maybe a sort of unexpected connection to geometry. And in fact, this theorem um, has been exploited by many authors over the years to understand geodesics by computing the homology of free loop spaces. So this is a question um, that people have been interested in for many, many years about the homology of free loop spaces. And there's an enormous body of work on this topic. What I want to tell you about today is um, another approach to add to the approaches to the homology of free loop spaces. Um, and I want to mention that many of the approaches to studying the homology of free loop spaces tie to what we call Hawk shield homology theories. So to get us started, I want to recall for everybody just what is classical Hawk shield homology. So what is Hawk shield homology? So I want to let K be a commutative ring and A a K algebra. Then I'm going to denote by HHA dot the simplicial K module that has um, R simplices. So at the Rth level, this is the algebra A tensored with itself R plus one times. I'm claiming, oh, I have some stray parentheses there, sorry. Okay, I'm claiming that this is a simplicial object. So to be a simplicial object, I need to tell you what is it at each level and what are the face and degeneracy maps that relate these different levels. And so what happens in this Hawk shield complex? So in the gray box on the left, I have a picture, you know, at each level, it's these tensor products of my algebra A. And I have face maps that go from R plus one copies of A to R copies of A. So those will go down in my picture. So I have face maps like so, I'll draw them in red. And what do the face maps do? Well, you feed it R plus one tensors um, and it just, the ith face map multiplies the ith and the i plus first coordinates. That makes sense as long as i is less than r. For the last one, you have nothing there to multiply with, and so you bring it around to the front and multiply with a0. So I'm going to write that in a slightly different way, just because it will be useful for us in a moment. So in other words, this is saying the ith face map is the identity on i coordinates uh, tensor with multiplication tensor with some more identities, maybe r minus i minus one, I think. Um, and the last one does a twist where it brings the last factor around to the front, then it multiplies and then has a bunch of identities on the other coordinates. 
Okay, and we also have degeneracy maps in the opposite direction that just insert a unit after the ith coordinate. So the degeneracy maps in my picture go like so. Okay, so I claim this is a simplicial object. You can check that the simplicial identities hold. And what is Hochschild homology? So Hochschild homology is defined in the following way. I could get a chain complex from this. So there's something to check there. If I take the alternating sum of these face maps, I claim that's a boundary, it squares to zero, and you get a chain complex. And Hochschild homology then is the homology of that chain complex. So that's a purely algebraic way of thinking about what Hochschild homology is. Now the Dold Kahn correspondence says, well, I could also think of it as the homotopy groups of the geometric realization of the simplicial object that I have. So it's sort of two different ways of characterizing what these Hochschild homology groups are. Okay, so Hochschild homology is some very classical invariant from homological algebra for an algebra. And I have a little chart here, <laughs> bear with me. I know that we're familiar with algebras, but on the left I've characterized, you know, what, what are the features of an algebra, right? In an algebra, we have a product and a unit, they satisfy some conditions. We want them to be associative and unital. I wanna think now about a dual notion to Hochschild homology. So what if instead of looking at algebras, we looked at co-algebras? So in the gray box on the right, I have the sort of analogous features of co-algebras. So a co-algebra instead of a product has a co-product, a map from C to C tensor C. It has a co-unit instead of a unit. And you know we ask to have, this diagram should commute, um, co-associativity and co-unitality. So you'll see that in essence, what we've done is we've reversed all the arrows. <laughs> so it turns out as we go on, we'll see life is not quite so simple as that, but that is sort of the philosophy of dualizing here is that the arrows all get reversed when we think about co-algebras versus algebras. And so you could ask a question, which is, you know, is there an invariant analogous to Hochschild homology for co-algebras, right? And it turns out that yes, there is, this is classical as well. There's something called co Hochschild homology, which was um, constructed first by Doi in the 70s. And so what is co Hochschild homology? Well, I'm gonna let D be a co-commutative, co-algebra over a field. And we're going to define now, instead of a simplicial object, a co-simplicial one. So we define a co-simplicial k-module, which I'll denote as co-hh. And at the rth level, this is, again, r plus one uh, tensor powers of my co-algebra d. Okay, simplicial objects have face and degeneracy maps. Co-simplicial objects, all the arrows get reversed. <laughs> so they have co-face maps and co-degeneracies. And what does that look like here? So the co-face maps now, you'll see are maps from R plus one copies to R plus two copies. So the co-face maps now go up my picture, like so. And how are they defined? Well, if you had not seen Kohak shield homology before, as many of you may not have, um, but I forced you to guess what the definition is, it's probably what you would guess, right? You know, you take the kind of map we had before and where you had a multiplication, you replace it with a co-multiplication, right? So before we had a multiplication, multiplying things, so we were collapsing two tensor factors to one. Now we have a co-multiplication, so one tensor factor becomes two, and we see why our map is now going up the diagram. The last one is a bit weird. So it again has a twist and a multiplication, now a co-multiplication in the first factor. But now my twist cycles the first entry to the end and I co-multiply first. So I co-multiply and then twist. Okay, those are the red arrows. The um, co-degeneracies now go down the diagram and instead of inserting a unit, we insert a co-unit. Okay, we get a complex like this. And just as before, we could we could pull a chain complex out of our um, picture with co Hochschild homology, we can associate a co chain complex. So by taking alternating sums of these co face maps, I get a co chain complex. And co Hochschild homology is the homology of that co chain complex. 
Okay, so these are both real classical theories in algebra. So why am I talking about this today? Or why are these of interest to topologists? Well, one answer to that is that, um, you know, in recent years, we've seen tremendous applications of Hochschild homology to topology through a generalization of Hochschild homology that's topological. So in particular, motivated by applications to algebraic K theory, in the early 90s, Vakshta developed a topological analog of Hochschild homology. And what is the principle here? Well, the principle here is something we see all the time in homotopy theory, right? Which is like, if we understand something in algebra, maybe we can ask, how does that translate to a topological version? And so in particular, if I think about top, uh, Hochschild homology of rings, what would be the topological analog of a ring? Well, I wanna think about ring spectra. So that's a spectrum that has a multiplication and a unit. We ask that those be associative and unital. Tensor products, um, the, see if I can monitor the chat at the same time. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, right. Uh, John is in the chat asking questions about the co-commutativity hypotheses. Yes, the commutativity here is confusing. You may, John, John picked up on a subtle point, which is that um, when I defined Hochschild homology, I did not assume things were commutative, but when I defined co-Hochschild homology, I did. Um, Things don't work as nicely over co-algebras as you might hope. And so a lot of times when I'm working with co-algebras, I'm going to assume everywhere that things are co-commutative and also that they're over a field, um, which was not a condition that I was putting on Hochschild homology. Um, and that has to do with subtleties in the sort of the homological algebra of co-algebras that I maybe we can talk about afterwards. <laughs> but yes, I am going to assume all of my co-algebras are co-commutative. Um, but you're so, right for, yes. Sorry, Sorry can I that. raise a kind of a, yeah, since you're yeah. answering question, related question. So when you're working over a field, you know, you could take HOM into K and go, I guess, between algebras to co-algebras or the other way around or something. And, and the, the situation that you're describing here between Hochschild homology and co-Hochschild homology looks like dual, like related yeah. by that, right? Yep. So under nice enough, like finiteness conditions, everything that I've said so far dualizes really nicely. It gets more complicated in the topological setting. <laughs> So, but in the algebra setting, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so Bakshad defines topological Hochschild homology, where we have uh, tensor products of algebra that becomes smash products in the topological setting. But then you can execute the same kind of simplicial construction we did before. You'd end up with a simplicial spectrum. Um, and we can define topological Hochschild homology to be the geometric realization of that simplicial spectrum. Okay, so what is where? So where are we? So I've said that you know there's this very classical theory. Uh, maybe before I even say this, I should mention that you know this topological theory of THH has had huge applications, um, particularly to algebraic K theory. And it's very prominently studied um, theory in uh, in homotopy theory, and so it leads us to the following kind of thought. So we have Hochschild homology, which is this very classical invariant of algebras. And I've generalized it in two, or generalized is the wrong word, but maybe taken analogs in two different directions. So in one direction, I said, okay, instead of looking at algebras, we could look at co-algebras and we could look at co-Hochschild. No, sorry, I like was writing and talking at the same time. Hochschild homology. We could look at co-Hochschild homology. And as I said, this was due to Doi in the 70s. I also generalized up here in a topological direction, right, to topological Hochschild homology, which I said has been a very fruitful thing to study. That was first constructed by Bachstad in the early 90s. And it leads to a question of, well, what about, you know, right here? <laughs> you know, is there a topological analog of co-Hochschild homology or similarly, a co-algebra analog of topological Hochschild homology, right? And so the answer to that is yes, it's a much more recent construction. So there's a construction of what's called topological co-Hochschild homology, homology, which is due um, to Hess and Shipley within the last five years or so. Okay, so how do we think about what topological co-Hochschild homology should be? 
Well, roughly it's the same kind of translation into topology that we did a moment ago for topological Hochschild homology. I take my co-Hochschild complex that we defined in algebra. And now instead of thinking about co-algebras in the algebraic sense, I wanna think about co-algebras in spectra. So what does that mean? Well, it's gonna be a spectrum with a co-multiplication map and a co-unit. Instead of taking tensor products, I'm gonna take smash products of spectra. And I can form a co-simplicial spectrum, which I call co-THH. There's a picture there of what that um, complex looks like. And then what is the co-THH spectrum? Well, with simplicial objects, we geometrically realize. With co-simplicial objects, we do the dual of geometric realization, which is totalization. Okay, so I totalize my co-simplicial object and we call that co-THH. Okay, so the claim of this talk is that this has something to do with free loop spaces, right? I said, we're gonna compute the homology of free loop spaces and then I've gone on this long tangent about Hochschild theories. And so I wanna bring it back to what does this have to do with free loop spaces? And to answer that question, we have to think first about, you know, how do we even get any examples of co-algebras in spectra. So what kinds of spectra would I expect to have a co-multiplication like this? And so I want to tell you about one big source of examples, which is suspension spectra. So I claim that for space X, the suspension spectrum of X is a co-algebra. Now, why would that be the case? Well, one really nice thing about spaces as opposed to spectra is that spaces have diagonal maps, right? So on spaces, I have a map from X to X cross X, which is just the diagonal. And what happens is that that yields a co-multiplication once we take a uh, really the spelling is bad today. Okay, I'm gonna try harder. Co-multiplication um, once we take suspension spectra. So I get a map from the suspension spectrum of X to the suspension spectrum of X smash the suspension spectrum of X. Okay, and that makes this into a co-algebra spectrum. And so you may think, maybe I would think if I were you, um, like that seems like maybe it's gonna be a boring example, right? I mean, it's coming from spaces, it's coming from the diagonal map on spaces, like maybe this isn't so interesting. Um, and I claim that this actually is a really interesting source of examples because CoTHH in this case uh, captures something really interesting. So how am I gonna justify that we should care about this example? Well, I wanna tell you about this theorem. So, I mean, attribution here is a little tricky. In the way I've written it down, it's due to Hess and Shipley, but in different language, so not using the term co-THH, it uh, is found in work of Kerry Malkovich and earlier it uh, follows from some work of Nick Kuhn. So I don't know, I'll put either all the names there. <laughs> um, so what do, what do they, what do they um, show in their work? They show that if X is a simply connected space, that when you look at a uh, topological Cohoc-Shield homology of the suspension spectrum, that you recover the suspension spectrum of free loop spaces. Okay, so here's our connection finally to what this is going to have to do with the homology of free loop spaces. And I started the talk by saying, okay, I wanna compute the homology of free loop spaces. So once we have this connection, you know, if I could develop computational tools for the left-hand side here, maybe I would find something out new about the homology of free loop spaces. So that's sort of the idea here is maybe knowing something about CoTHH can tell us something new about loop spaces. Okay, but if I'm gonna do that, then I need to know something about CoTHH. So the first question that comes up is how do we compute uh, the homology? So I'm interested in homology of free loop spaces. So how do I compute the homology of topological Cohoc shield homology. So um, I considered with collaborators this question a few years ago of how do you compute the homology of CoTHH? And here's what we found. We developed a spectral sequence 
to compute the homology of CoTHH. Um, we call it the Kobachstead spectral sequence for reasons that will become clear momentarily. <laughs> um, and the, the really nice thing about this story is what the E2 term is here. So our spectral sequence computes the homology of CoTHH like we wanted. But what is the E2 term? Well, the E2 term is CoHH. So this is the classical algebraic theory. Let me try that again. This is the classical algebraic theory of co Hochschild homology that I introduced at the very beginning. Okay, so um, that should always be easier to compute, right? Our expectation is that those theor theories from homological algebra have easier computational tools. So the idea here is we can try to understand co Hochschild homology for this E2 term and recover something about the homology of co THH. Now, um, the way that you arrive at this spectral sequence is that it, by looking at the Bauss field con spectral sequence for the cosimplicial object that, uh, that we defined co THH from. And for those of you who do Bauss field con spectral sequences regularly, you know that convergence in that spectral sequence is not automatic. So part of this work is also identifying conditions under which this converges. I'm not going to go into that today because that's not really the aspect of this that I want to focus on, but there are. Um, convergence conditions there to be careful of. And I'll mention the appropriate conditions when we need them. And so why is this the Kobach spectral sequence? Well, just a reminder that the main computational tool for or one of the main computational tools for studying topological Hochschild homology is a spectral sequence developed by Bokshted called the Bokshted spectral sequence. And it's a very similar story. So our story for CoTHH turns out to be quite analogous to what happens in the algebra setting. Bokshted uh, constructed this spectral sequence and showed that the E2 term is ordinary Hochschild homology. OK, so this tool that we developed is general for any co-algebra spectrum C, but I'm particularly interested in um, my suspension spectra, right? Because that was the case that connected to free loop spaces. So I'm particularly interested in when the co-algebra is a suspension spectrum. And so what, you know, if you plug in C is a suspension spectrum into our theorem up here, the Kobachstedt spectral sequence, here's what you get. It says if your space is simply connected and then there's some conditions that are for convergence, <laughs> um, then we have this spectral sequence that computes the homology I will not let me highlight over that blue, fine. It computes the homology of free loop spaces. Um, and that E2 term is in the Kohawk shield homology of the homology of X. Okay, so this is um, a, a new different approach to understanding um, the homology of free loop spaces. Okay, and what I wanna talk about today is what can you do with this? Okay, so whenever we have uh, a new spectral sequence, one question we wanna ask is, or at least me, one question I wanna ask is, what kind of algebraic structure does that spectral sequence have, right? If I'm gonna to try to do calculations with this thing, I wanna understand like, what are the tools that I have to work with here? So the goal of the work that I really want to dive into today is that question, is what is the, what is the algebraic structure here? So I'd like to understand the algebraic structure um, in the Kobachstead spectral sequence. So the kind of thing I have in mind, like is, is it a spectral sequence of algebras, that kind of thing that's useful in computing um, with your spectral sequence. So you might wonder like, why do I expect it necessarily to have any algebraic structure, right? Like maybe it, it just doesn't. Um, and so one reason that I might expect it to comes from what happens in the dual situation with Hochschild homology. So Hochschild theories in general have a lot of algebraic structure to them. So I wanna uh, tell you in particular about a proposition of Angeltweit and Rognes. 
I don't know about you all, but I find it very stressful to talk about other people's work with them here. So hi, <laughs> hopefully I don't uh, mangle what you would say about your own work. But so I want to talk about some work of Engelbert and Ragnus. Um, and one piece of their work, which I'll say more about in a moment, is, uh, is about some structure that you have on Hochschild homology. Okay, so they show in their work that if A is commutative, um, oh, well, okay. Yes, if A is commutative and the Hochschild homology of A is flat as an A module, then the Hochschild homology of A is an A Hopf algebra. Okay, so this is saying that Hochschild homology has really a lot of structure to it. It's a Hopf algebra. And I put here like a crash course reminder and what that means just because we are going to use these algebraic structures a lot. So just a reminder that a Hopf algebra is an algebra and a co-algebra. It has a product and a co-product, unit and co-unit. It also has an antipode. I'm not going to dwell on that today. Um, and then there are a whole lot of diagrams, which I have spared you all of them, but there are lots of compatibilities. I wrote one for you to illustrate the kind of thing I mean. The diagrams say things like, okay, so I have the pro product and the co-product, but they need to be compatible with one another. So what happens if you start with two copies of your hot algebra and do the product and then the co-product? And this diagram below is telling you that, you know, this needs to commute. Okay, there are lots, lots more diagrams, which I am not writing down. Okay, so Hopf algebra is, um, is, has both a product and a co-product. And so, you know, this proposition I mentioned of Engelbert and Ragnus says that um, Hochschild homology is supposed to have this structure under some mild flatness conditions. It's supposed to have both a product and a co-product. And so I want to say a little bit about why, why that would be true. So I'm not going to reprove their proposition, but I want to give you a sense of why this is true. Whoops, sorry. So why is the Hochschild homology of A an A Hopf algebra? Well, here's the idea or one way to think about why you would expect this to be true. So we're working in the commutative setting now. So for commutative A, the claim is that I can identify this Hochschild. Um, we defined this. Yeah, I wrote it like this before. We defined this simplicial object earlier that gave us the Hochschild complex. And the claim is that I can identify that as a simplicial tensor of, so I'm going to identify this as a tensor with the simplicial circle. So what does that mean? That means roughly that I get a copy of A for every simplex in the simplicial circle. And the simplicial circle at the qth level has q plus one entries. And so I'm gonna get like, you know, q plus one copies of A at each simplicial level. And then there's a way to make sense of how the maps from this simplicial tensor um, arise, which I'm not going to go into. But if you do this exercise, you check and you see that, yes, this actually is this simplicial tensor. So if you're not familiar with that, I wouldn't dwell on it. I would just, the takeaway from that is that in some sense, Hochschild homology is like tensoring with S1. So why does that give me this Hopf algebra structure? Well, it means that if I have simplicial maps on S1, that they may give me maps on Hochschild homology. Okay, so for instance, I have a map from S1 wedge S1 to S1, which is just the fold map, right? I fold those two copies together. So this is the fold map. And um, what Engelbert Ragnus show in their work is that if you unpack what does that simplicial map do under this tensor, and then you look at what happens, you know, once you take uh, homology and whatnot, you get a product on Hochschild homology. So that hopefully seems plausible to you, <laughs> that that map from S1 wedge S1 to S1 gives you a product in Hochschild homology. Similarly, you know, I have a nice map from a base point into S1, um, and that gives me a unit map on Hochschild homology. I have a map from S1 back to the base point. That's going to give me a co-unit map on Hochschild homology. And then what do I want to be a Hopf algebra? I needed to have a product 
and a co-product, right? So the next thing I want is I want a co-product. Now, why did I put a bunch of question marks there? So what do we want? You know, if you're following the pattern here, what kind of map do I want here? Well, I want to have a map from S1 to S1 wedge S1. Okay, that's the kind of map that I want there. There's an additional subtlety here. So if I ask you, you know, like what's a good map from S1 to S1 wedge S1, probably everybody goes like this, right? The pinch map, right? That's a good map from the circle to a wedge of two circles. So I want this to be the pinch map. What is the additional subtlety? Well, the additional subtlety is that that's not a simplicial map of the standard sort of simplicial circle. So I need simplicial maps for this story to go through and how do they get around this issue? Well, we can replace, so right now my simplicial circle is like this, right? I've got one zero simplex, one non-degenerate, one simplex. I could replace my simplicial circle with a different model of the circle that looks like this, where I have two zero simplices. And then I can get a simplicial map that is a pinch map. And we can call that the double circle. Okay, and then there's some work to do that the double circle still gives you Hochschild homology when you um, go through all this and they thankfully do these things for us. And so we get a co-product. And then we also wanted that antipode. The antipode, we're gonna use our double circle again, and this is a simplicial flip map. So once we have a double circle, we can flip and that gives us an antipode. Okay, so that is the philosophy at least of why we would expect um, Hochschild homology to be a hot algebra. It comes from these simplicial maps on S1. That's, I think, the thing to take away. So Engelbart and Rognes prove this proposition as part of uh, a much larger theorem. And so what did they conclude from this? Um, so they then went on to show that, you know, this, this tells me that the E2 term of the Bokshut spectral sequence has a lot of algebraic structure, right? That's what this says, because the E2 term is Hochschild homology. So Engelbart and Rognes' theorem, though, is that actually the whole spectral sequence has a lot of algebraic structure. So there's some flatness conditions here, but under some nice flatness conditions, they prove that the Bokshut spectral sequence for THH is a spectral sequence of Hopf algebras over the homology of R. So I'm not going to write in detail what the definition of a spectral sequence of Hopf algebras is, but how are you supposed to think about that? It means that our spectral sequence, so in other words, it has a product and a co-product, right? It's a Hopf algebra. And, you know, they, they respect the differential in a nice way. So what does that mean? Well, we um, probably are familiar with what that means for a product. It means we have the Leibniz rule in our spectral sequence, which, you know, our friend of the product rule, <laughs> the differential on a product is the differential in the first thing times the second plus or minus x dy, right? So we're going to be able to use the Leibniz rule in this spectral sequence. But it also tells me that I have a co-Leibniz rule. So that may be less familiar. So what is the co-Leibniz rule? Well, the Leibniz rule is about what happens if you take a product and then a differential. The co-Leibniz rule is the dual thing. So it's going to tell you what happens if you take a differential and then a co-product. And the co-Leibniz rule says that this is the co-product followed by D tensor one plus or minus one tensor D. You can stare at that for a minute if you want and, and um, conclude for yourself that that is dual to the Leibniz rule. <laughs> but this is the kind of rule that you get um, for a spectral sequence of co-algebras. Okay, and this is a lot of algebraic structure to add to the box jet spectral sequence. And this paper of Engelbart and Rognes, they then go on to do some amazing THH calculations using all of this algebraic structure, now knowing that this is a spectral sequence of hot algebras. And this has certainly been used um, in the intervening years in a lot of calculations. Okay, so that makes me wonder, you know, what about for co THH, right? What about the dual setting? So what was our hope when we started thinking about this? Our hope is that, you know, we would like something similar, right? We would like a similar structure in the co spectral sequence. Okay. 
Okay, that's what we were thinking when we started this project. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you're like me, at least what I was thinking at the outset was like, surely it all just dualizes, right? I mean, like if you think about this, angle by wrong, just say that we have a product and a co-product in the Bakshet spectral sequence. Now, a product, when you dualize everything, should become a co-product. And the co-product should become a product. And so surely this hop algebra over here just dualizes to a hop algebra over here and we should be done. Like I just reverse all the arrows and should all, everything should be good. Um, and in some you know, moral sense, that is what happens, but it's, uh, it's more subtle than that. And so I wanna explain why it doesn't, why we can't just like be like, okay, done. Um, why this isn't just an exercise. Um, so, the reason we think that you know we, we expect to have some algebraic structure is the, at the heart of the Engelbite Rodney's argument is looking at simplicial maps on S1 and viewing things as tensoring with S1. For Cohawk shield homology, we can view things as co-tensoring with S1. So there's some notion that makes sense there. And we can try to use simplicial maps on S1 again. And so we do get some algebraic structure. We can see, yes, there should be algebraic structure. But what is the subtlety? Well, we got to go back and really look at angle by Rodness's result a little more carefully. It doesn't just say that it's a spectral sequence of Hopf algebras. It says it's a spectral sequence of Hopf algebras over the homology of R. Okay, so what is the subtlety? The subtlety is that when we try to execute the same sort of simplicial arguments based on simplicial maps of the circle, we do get an algebraic structure, but we get an algebraic structure over the homology of C. Okay, which maybe is what you would expect. That seems analogous. But why is that a problem? Well, the problem is what is C? It's a coalgebra in spectra. And so what is the homology of C? This is a coalgebra, not a ring. And so it doesn't even make sense to ask if it's a hot algebra over that because that's not a thing, right? Like a hot algebra exists over a ring, not over a coalgebra. Okay, so this is sort of the subtlety here is that everything, all the algebraic structure in the Kovacstead spectral sequence lives over a coalgebra. And so um, that adds a lot of subtlety. Okay, so how do we get around that or what, get around is the wrong word. So what, what, what happens? What happens is that you need to know how to define a hot algebra over a coalgebra. So that's not something that was in the literature. We're sort of seeing a different algebraic structure in this spectral sequence than one that comes up in other situations. So in the pink box here, I have a definition that's new that we've made of what it means to be a box hot algebra. All of the stuff in the little boxes is classical. It's just classical co-algebra theory that you know, if you really want to understand what's in the pink box, you need to know what does it mean to be a co-module? What does it mean to take a co-tensor product? Anyway, if you want to zoom in and read those things, you can. Um, it's maybe not so essential. The point is that we have, you know, they're in classical coalgebra theory. There are notions of co-modules and co-tensor products. Um, and you can put that together to talk about what it should mean to be a hot algebra over a coalgebra, which we call a box hot algebra. Okay. And so what do we do with that once we've so, okay, so we, in our work, we define these box hot algebras, and then you have to also do a lot of uh, homological algebra foundations in this setting, right? So we prove theorems like versions of eilenberg zilber theorems and Kunith theorems where now you're doing everything over a coalgebra. So you have to generalize a lot of the classical homological algebra that exists over a ring to versions that exist now over a coalgebra. How do those make sense in this setting? Okay, so once you lay all those foundations of developing the homological algebra that you need to talk about this algebraic structure, then what can you do? So our first theorem that we show with this, which is um, joint with Anna Marie Bowman and uh, Brooke Shipley and myself, is we show that for a simply connected space, and K a field, if the homology of the free loop space is flat, no, co-flat, sorry, let's forget the co's, co-flat, here's the definition of co-flat, if you wanna know what that means, as a co-module over the homology of X, 
then the homology of the free loop space of X is a box hop algebra over the homology of X. So this theorem is saying that this algebra that we've described, it's not some sort of pathological thing. It actually captures something that happens in the homology of free loop spaces for simply connected spaces. So this, um, this algebraic structure is something you know, that arises in this sort of natural way in the homology of free loop spaces. And that's sort of a new structure to the homology of free loop spaces. But that wasn't the question we were trying to answer, right? We were trying to answer what is the algebraic structure in the co-boxed spectral sequence? And so what is the answer? Well, the answer is maybe no, maybe no surprise, is that we show that it's a spectral sequence of box hop algebras. Okay, so we have um, this is completely analogous to what Engelbert and Ragnus show in the THH case. Um, we have this result for co THH. Okay, and so then what do we do? Well, then we use this to make calculations, right? We I started this talk by saying I want to compute the homology of free loop spaces. And I claim now that this can help us. So how do we compute the homology of free loop spaces? So the goal now, which I'll tell you about in the last couple of minutes, is how does this work out when I want to compute the homology of some free loop spaces? OK, so this tool is particularly well suited to study the homology of free loop spaces for spaces x, where I know something about the cohomology algebra. <laughs> Make sure I put the codes in the right place there. Um, so that's a question that a lot of people have asked in the past is if we understand the cohomology of X, do we understand the homology of its free loop space? This is a very classical question. And so I want to mention some previous work of Kuribayashi and Yamaguchi, which is from the 90s. So Kuribayashi and Yamaguchi proved that if you have a simply connected space where the cohomology is exterior on two generators in odd degrees, and then they have these conditions on the dimensions of the generators. Then for P greater than or equal to three, they compute the homology of free loop spaces. So this is like any space X that satisfies these conditions, they've computed the homology of the free loop space of X. Okay, so what do we do in our work? So we expand uh, or generalize Kirby-Ashi. So one result that we have based on our um, our new algebraic structure is the following, which extends the Kuribayashi and Yamaguchi result. So what does this say? So we're looking similarly at spaces with exterior cohomology. Now we're not limiting ourselves to two generators, so arbitrarily many generators, finite number of generators in odd degree. We have this condition here on how the degrees of the generators relate to the characteristic of the field. Okay, and that's what that condition is. But if the generators satisfy those conditions, we compute the homology of free loop spaces explicitly. So we find that it's exterior on some generators, tensor polynomial on some generators, and I've put the degrees of the generators there. Okay, so this is with a totally different approach than Kuribayashi and Yamaguchi were using, and their approach didn't extend past two generators. So this, this new approach is uh, more general in that sense. We can think about arbitrarily many generators. If you hone in on the two generator case and you like, uh, if you're bored, you can <laughs> compare the combinatorics of their like dimension range and our dimension range. And you see that like for P at least five, uh, we get a broader range. So we can see a little bit more broadly than they can see with their, their dimension ranges. And so it's a bit of a generalization in the two generator case as well. Um, okay, so this is telling us something, you know, about any space whose, uh, that has that kind of cohomology. And I'll just mention that this recovers, you know, for appropriate choices of the prime, this recovers some known calculations, classical things about the homology of free loop spaces for SUN and SPN. Um, we have other computational results different than this one, but also recover things about the free loop space of uh, CP infinity, BUN, BSUN, BSPN. So we can see a lot of classical calculations from this lens. We can recover them this way, uh, which is nice. Okay, I'm essentially out of time. I wanna say one minute about the actual approach. Like, how do you use this? And here's the key. My last thing I wanna mention <laughs> is the key to doing these calculations is the following proposition, 
which says that under some co-flatness conditions, um, a little, let me highlight. Oh, good. Here's the part. The shortest non-zero differential in lowest total degree has to map from an indecomposable to a primitive. Okay, so we define in our work, what does it mean to be a box indecomposable? What does it mean to be a box primitive element? And then we use this algebraic structure to eliminate possible or to prove that a lot of possible differentials are zero. Because this proposition says that the shortest non-zero differential in low, lowest total degree has to start from an indecomposable and go to a primitive. So we can do a lot of degree-based arguments about, you know, here's where the indecomposables live in this kind of example, here's where the primitives live in this kind of example, and eliminate a lot of possible differentials that way. So this is where the new algebraic structure um, really comes in uh, useful in this kind of calculation. Okay, I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop there.